Welcome to the Vocation of the Common Good podcast. I'm your host, Philip Lorish. Today, my guest is Isaac Wardell, Director of Worship at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Charlottesville, Virginia. Isaac's also the founder of the Porter's Gate Worship Project, whose first record, Work Songs, was recently released. Isaac is particularly interested in the ways church leaders can form the imaginations of their congregations through song and liturgy. I hope you enjoy our conversation. My God, my God, wherever I go, glory, where I reap and where I sow, glory, and my hands they quit the thorn, glory, in the still land. Isaac, what do you think the church is not paying sufficient attention to? What should it be paying attention to? I work in Charlottesville, Virginia. I work as the director for worship at a large evangelical church in the city. And if people were not familiar with Charlottesville before this summer, many people have become familiar with Charlottesville in light of other recent events, the so-called Unite the Right rally, as well as the March on the University of Virginia the preceding night. And while there are many interesting conversations around the country that have emerged out of those events, one of the conversations that we have to have as a church is not only how are we responding pastorally to a situation like that. And of course, this is very acute in Charlottesville because our church is located just a mile away from all those events. And we have many members who are deeply involved personally in a lot of the things that transpired in Charlottesville. So it's incumbent on our churches to ask pastoral questions and actually ask, how does an event like this affect our congregation and how can we shepherd our people well, right? And I think that our church, as what I would describe as a multi-generational church, a thoughtful church, a church that cares about its neighbors, I think that our church has addressed that question. I think our church has been thoughtful and continues to be in rich conversations about what are our pastoral responsibilities to our people. But one question that our church is not asking, and this is a question that many evangelical churches are not asking, is the question of what are our responsibilities to our neighbors? How do these events in Charlottesville actually bring to the surface the ways not just that we need to be forming our people differently, but actually questions about how do we need to be serving our neighbors differently. And so what this looks like in my job as someone who plans worship at a large evangelical church each week is that I think we have, for the most part, faithfully answered the call to say these terrible things have happened here in our community, which are reflective of terrible things happening in our nation and our world. And so we need to respond to those things in worship We need to pray for our city. We need to lament the brokenness of our world. We need to hear testimonies from people and hear about the places that the kingdom of God is actually breaking through, but also hear stories about the brokenness of the world. And those all sort of fall into this category of how church is for the church, how church actually can form people to think differently about the communities that we live in. But what our particular church has really not grappled with is what it looks like for us to step outside of our doors to step into our streets and to actually engage in real questions, to ask our neighbors, how can we serve you better and how can we make this city a more just, a safer, a kinder place? And I think that as long as we're not willing to ask those kinds of questions, as long as we're not walking outside of our church doors and asking our neighbors, how can our church serve you better? There's always going to be a sort of malformation that we're doing within our church because those questions have to inform the questions that we're asking. So I guess that's a really practical example of that tension in my hometown of Charlottesville. But I also think that that question applies to many of our churches at many times. That is to ask this question of not just what are my pastoral responsibilities to my people, but for Christian leaders to say, what are my church responsibilities to my neighbor? Do you think that's unique to race at this point? Lots of churches are asking the question of the welfare of the neighbor in terms of outreach, in terms of other forms of ministry that may well include people outside of the church as ways of trying to get them inside the church? Does it feel that race is a distinctive category where the work is actually of a different kind? I actually don't think that it is specific to race. I think that this dynamic is absolutely pervasive in the way that we think about the church's place in the community. A totally different example. Currently, it's September of 2017, for those who might be listening to this later, and there's a big topic 
in evangelical churches right now on the Nashville statement. It's a statement about the nature of biblical sexuality. And I will go ahead and show my hand and say, I agree with everything in the Nashville statement. There is not a sentence that I would pull out as a confessing Christian with generally orthodox biblical beliefs. There is not a particular sentence I would pull out of that document and say that I disagreed with. And yet I would not sign that statement. And the reason is this very question about our neighbors, because to give kind of an animating image, if we are thinking of ourselves as a missionary church, a church that exists not just for ourselves, but a church that exists for our neighbors, if that's the imagination that we have, then I don't think that the Nashville statement makes very much sense. Because it's hard for me to imagine Hudson Taylor showing up on the shores of China 150 years ago and looking around at his neighbors and saying, I think the first thing I need to do is write a statement about all the ways that they are misunderstanding sexuality. That's not the missionary imagination. That's not the animation that Jim Elliott had when he showed up in the 1950s to people who had never heard the gospel. He didn't show up and say, the first thing we need to do is diagnose the ways that our neighbors are wrong. Yet they actually showed up in vulnerability with love, asking the question, what do our neighbors need? And so I think the very emergence of the Nashville statement as a way of relating to our neighbors is indicative to me that the church has lost that missionary imagination and instead turned to identity politics as a way of understanding who our neighbors are. By that you mean some sense of we, the church, know who we are because we've drawn clear lines. That's right about what we think of those outside of here. Yeah, absolutely. And frankly, I've heard defenders and writers of that statement actually describe the value of the document as being, this is a plumb line. We need to have a plumb line that shows this is the difference between biblical sexuality and non-biblical sexuality. Well, I think it's a pretty good plumb line. It's not clear to me that that's what our neighbors need or even what our church needs right now, as much as it is an open door of us actually doing the same creative work we're putting into making those plumb lines for us to do the creative work of saying, what does it look like to welcome our neighbors into the church? That's a different kind of work than the work of building walls. Tell me more about a missionary imagination. You said that the ways in which these heroes of the faith who took the faith to foreign lands approached those lands as they landed on shore was representative of something that we in America need to reinvigorate and somehow embody. But what is the missionary imagination? I think first, as an aside, it's worth mentioning that I understand the idea of a missionary imagination might be problematic for some people because of some historical problems of colonialism and missionaries and some people being uncomfortable with that kind of language. I want to sort of put that conversation about some of the harms done by the missionary age of the 20th century. If we could put that aside for a second and actually just talk about being a missionary in the best possible way. (laughs) So for us to just use our imagination to say, what is it that a missionary does in the best case scenario? Then the best case scenario, what a missionary does is a missionary looks at the gifts, the talents, the resources that God has given her. And she looks at where the need is. In this case, maybe it's in another country or another culture. And she takes those resources, those talents, those gifts, Everything with which God is in doubt her. She takes those things and she shows up in this new place and she looks around with the eyes of love. And with the eyes of love, she asks the question, how can I take everything that God has given me and serve these people? I think that's sort of the basis for a missionary imagination. And I would actually say that many of us have actually had a glimpse of this kind of missionary imagination, even when we've done things like short-term missions trips or maybe being involved with some sort of an urban ministry in your own city, where there are contexts in which we sort of put on the eyes of missionary imagination, where maybe we do walk into a place where the need is very pronounced. And we put on that imagination and we think to ourselves, what is it that I have? What has God given me? And how can I serve these people and serve this need with these things? And yet... And this is kind of getting back to that first question you asked about what is the most important thing the church isn't doing. It is not clear to me that when we look at our own streets, at our own places of work, at our own communities, at our own political process, that we have that same missionary imagination. It seems clearer to me that we actually take off that imagination and instead we put on an imagination that's been given to us, maybe by talk shows or maybe by books that we've read or narratives that we've inhabited about what it is to be a Christian in the late modern world. But when it comes to the missionary imagination, that is always about seeing the gifts that God has given us as individuals and as a church in general, seeing those gifts primarily in terms of the ways that they can be stewarded for the good of our neighbors. 
If you don't build it, we labor in vain. Without your spirit, we stand with no strength. I know my time is passing away. of your hands what will remain let the favor You are a musician, you're also a parent, you're also a friend, you're also a resident of a street, of a neighborhood. All of these things are forms of identity for you. How do you, particularly in your capacity as a worship director at a church, direct others towards this missionary imagination or mindset? I think there are a few steps to it. I think the first step is probably some sort of an audit some sort of self-examination, maybe beginning at the very bottom with just asking the question, am I doing harm in this area? <laughs> or, you know, is my church doing harm in this area? So I think as a first step, it's worth evaluating, for example, one of the most public manifestations of the life of the church, which is a weekly worship service. So to think about your church's weekly worship gathering and to think about what it is that not just our neighbors, but our own members. If we were to just have a tape recorder up, you know, and we're explaining Christianity to aliens or to people who, you know, dig through the rubble of North American Christianity a thousand years from now or something. I wonder what we would hear. I wonder what story about personhood we would hear. I wonder what story about our neighbors that we would hear. Sometimes we have a lot of assumptions that, oh, well, people implicitly understand all these different things about their identity, about their sexual orientation, about virtue, about how to do their jobs well. We make a lot of those assumptions, and I think if you were to hold up a tape recorder to a worship service, you would frequently hear ways that we actually subvert the missionary identity of the church. From the front, you mean? From the front, yeah, actually from up front, from the ways that we talk about Christianity. Hearing ourselves played back to us is always an incredibly revealing moment, and analyzing our language and thinking yeah, really seriously. And I will give you a real practical example of this. At our church, we have a practice of involving lay people, that is just members at large of the congregation, in leading worship, not just playing music, but leading in prayer, reading scriptures, acting as the liturgist, as they would say in some traditions. And these worship leaders, while sometimes they read scripted prayers, like the Lord's Prayer or whatever, for the most part, they're leading prayer in their own words. And so one of the assignments that I give them from time to time not too frequently, but from time to time, I'll give our lay worship leaders the assignment of going back and listening to a recording of the worship service. And it's always an interesting conversation, you know? In some cases, a worship leader may notice, oh, wow, I really use a lot of adjectives to describe who God is, but I don't really use a lot of verbs to describe how he's at work in the world. That's an interesting dynamic that people will notice. But another thing that people will notice is sometimes a disposition to speak to God almost exclusively in individual sort of pronoun terms. They listen to their prayers and they realize, oh, all of my prayers are about I and my, and I don't have a default setting about praying for we and our. Someone will listen back to a prayer and they'll realize, oh, I never prayed for our neighbors. Oh, I never prayed for the world or I never prayed for our nation. And I think it's in that discipline of listening back to ourselves that sometimes the Holy Spirit can actually reveal to us some of the places where we're telling a story that we don't mean to tell. I think it's important in any church tradition, in any denomination, because of course we all have different sorts of routines in our weekly worship, for us to identify what are the sort of foundational things that we want to be affirming week after week. I work in a broadly evangelical church in the Reformed tradition. And even when I was growing up, we used to talk about the prayer language of adoration and confession and thanksgiving and supplication. That's kind of an easy way to start, you know, a worship audit to kind of say, hey, are we doing those things? And then within the context of those things, as you start to ask harder questions about, well, what does it look like to do adoration well? What does it look like to do supplication well? then every one of those kind of becomes its own conversation. And it's generally going to illuminate the places where our worship practices are really pretty anemic. That when you start asking a question like, how do we do supplication well? How do we ask God to help us well? That as we listen to recordings of what it is we're talking about, that we may notice, 
either a propensity to just pray for our own needs, to pray for the needs of the church, or perhaps a propensity to only pray for whatever the crisis du jour is. That's all that the prayers ever are. Or maybe it's a propensity toward praying always for issues of justice and not praying for issues of mercy and care and grieving. But whatever it is, I think that when we have some sort of foundational rubrics, maybe in a particular church tradition, it's just to say we want to proclaim the whole gospel every Sunday, that every Sunday we want to proclaim this is who God is, what his character is. This is who we are as sinners. This is what Christ has done for us when he died on the cross. This is what he is doing for us now as he is resurrected and seated at the right hand of God. Maybe that's the rubric. It's actually pretty similar to the adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication thing. But whatever it is, Once we sort of make those priorities to say these are the things we want to be saying, and that's an easy conversation to have with a group of Christians or of church leaders, then it's not quite so hard for us to listen back and say, are we faithfully saying that each week? We bring our gifts, we bring our power. struck by your work as a songwriter and largely the songs that we've been commissioning and you've been having people write. Singing plays a particularly important role, forming Christians and forming the imagination, oftentimes more so than even, I guess, more scripted prayers or other forms of worship. In song, we are able to both express important things and find ourselves changed. I'm struck by a comment that was made as a part of this whole project where we commissioned work songs, this album that's coming forth, and these liturgical materials that you've been working so hard to produce on the concept of vocation. I was struck by a comment that one participant made that said, we seem to be writing more and more songs about fewer and fewer things. That seems right to me, but I'm not a worship director. I'm a church member. If that's right, what can we do to actually change that? I feel like I have to give a little bit of context for an answer to this of my own story when it comes to leading worship and writing hymns. I grew up broadly evangelical in a non-denominational church, was involved in leading worship even back in high school and college. And and for the most part, that was in the context of what you might call contemporary Christian music or Christian rock, that whole world. At the age of about 18, I sort of walked away from all that. I started at Covenant College, which at the time had a very strictly Baroque music program, had a music program with a very strong focus on hymnody, particularly Western hymnody. And at the time I got to college, I really embraced this sort of lost tradition of Western hymnody, this tradition that had been lost on me as a child growing up in a broadly evangelical church. And at the time, if we would have done this podcast when I was 18 or 19 years old, I would have had a lot to say about the poetry of the great hymns of the faith, about the timeless truths that they put to music, you know. I would have had a lot to say about how these great Western hymns that have survived through the generations, through the centuries, that they have survived because of some sort of implicit excellence that they have. And today in 2017, on the one hand, I would still affirm all those things. I am still something of a hymn buff. I collect hymnals at my church. We still sing classic hymns of the 19th, 18th, 17th century very regularly in worship. And yet something has changed in the way that I think about hymnody and the way I think about the role of the church songwriter today. Over the course of the last 20 years, it's changed in many ways, but two particular junctures were pretty powerful and formative for me. One of them was in the early 2000s when I discovered the music of Stuart Townend. Interestingly enough, the person you just quoted who was involved with our project was actually Stuart Townend who made that observation that we're writing more and more songs about fewer and fewer things. And I remember when I heard the music of Stuart Town and when I heard the hymn he wrote, How Deep the Father's Love for Us, or the hymn in Christ Alone, something in my imagination sort of flared where it occurred to me, oh, it is still possible for us to write 
great hymns. It is still actually possible for us to write poetry. It is still possible for us to set theology to music in a really powerful way. And so it was at that time in the early 2000s, and I've actually told Stuart the story, that I was really inspired to realize that we don't just need to leave that inspirational work of the Holy Spirit to write these beautiful hymns, that we don't just need to leave that to the work of the past, but we can actually embrace that for the work of the present to say, let's not just sit in the shadow of those great hymns, but let's actually imagine what it could look like for us studying the scriptures, for us working hard in our acumen as writers, for us to actually write songs like that, that are for our present moment. So that was the first sort of critical juncture for me. And the second critical juncture for me came really in the last 10 years as I began to go a little deeper into the historical context of my favorite hymns. As I started to learn more about not just the notes on the page and not just the theological concepts that these hymns would summarize, but as I began to read more about the historical context, the cultural context out of which these particular hymns emerged, it became clearer and clearer to me that so much of the value of these great hymns was not just in the way that they depicted these transcendent truths about who God is and what he's done, but actually the way that these hymns were applying those truths creatively to the questions of their parishioners and their neighbors. I'll just give you one example of this. Many of us are familiar with a sort of 19th century very popular poetic trope in 19th century British hymnody. And that is the idea that when we die, Jesus will hold us to his breast, that Jesus will cradle us in his arms, that Jesus will welcome us, that we will rise and that Jesus will comfort us. And it's an interesting image. It's an image that comes up very regularly in hymns from that era. You even think about a popular hymn like Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. And even in Jesus Loves Me, you have this image, if I love him when I die, he'll take me home on high. And some of these images about Jesus cradling us, it's interesting how frequent they are relative to how little that imagery appears in the Bible. And so you go back and you kind of look for where did the imagery come from, and it turns out it's pretty clear. These hymns were written in a particular context of 19th, early 20th century industrial revolution, that particularly in England and in the United States, when child mortality rates were at an all-time high, when priests and people doing pastoral care for families were faced very regularly with childhood mortality, And maybe, you know, Sally comes to her priest and she says, where is Billy this week? And Billy has passed away due to some sort of a side effect of the Industrial Revolution. And the pastor, he has to say something. And maybe what he creatively comes up with is to say, well, you know what it is to go to sleep. You know what it is to rest. Well, today, Bobby is at rest in Jesus's arms and Jesus is the one cradling him. It's not your mother that's cradling him, it's Jesus that's cradling him. And so in that instant, While that particular image, while that particular poetic trope might not be explicitly there in the Bible, you know, you can't really find anything about Jesus cradling us in his arms. That was actually creative work being done by those hymn writers and those pastors to say, what are the pains of my people? What are the questions that they're asking? And how can I take the truths of scriptures? And that is a real biblical truth that Jesus promises us the resurrection of the body, that he promises us that he will wipe away the tear from every eye. To take that truth and actually put it into language and into imagery that even a child with an unanswerable question like that could find some solace or comfort in. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with As I began to find more and more of those stories, it made me not only appreciate those hymns that much more, but it also stirred in me this desire to say, well, what are the questions that our neighbors are asking today? And how is it that we can be addressing those questions through new poetic tropes, through new ways of singing, through new images, through new hymns? And so pertaining to this particular project, we started this conversation about two years ago about one of the particular places that we see a dearth of church worship material is on this subject of calling and vocation. That the fact is people are asking so many questions about their work, about their vocations in the world. I would actually argue that a lot of the hottest issues of the culture war in the last couple of years end up being questions about vocation. You know, you think about these really popular Supreme Court decisions about Hobby Lobby and the nature of what are an employer's obligations to its employees, questions about whether or not conservative Christian bakers or pizza parlor owners, who they need to serve as clientele. A lot of these questions, they're actually vocational questions. They're questions about what is my work in the world and what does God ask of me about my work in the world? 
People have a very emotionally powerful reaction to hearing their job, hearing their work, to hearing their vocation named in church when they don't usually hear it, and having a blessing spoken over them in their work. That is something that actually speaks to people very deeply because people are generally bringing their work and bringing their vocations into church with them, and they would love to have it spoken to. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. For I called you, called you by name. Mm, yeah. Your labor is not in vain. Oh, yeah. I am with you. I am with you. Oh, I am with you. Oh, I am with you. For I called you. If you open up your hymnal, or if you go to a website and you look for what are the 20 most popular worship songs in America right now, you are not going to find a lot of songs that address these questions. And so we took it upon ourselves about two years ago to begin asking, what would it look like for us to address those questions, not only in song form, but also in terms of writing prayers and putting together liturgical materials for whom those kind of resources would be useful in worship. And, and addressing the question is giving images, right? Giving language for people to find themselves in. Yeah, that's right. For us, we took a number of different approaches. It was a little bit of a tall order because, uh, you know, at first glance as a writer, as a creative person, you might look at this assignment of, hey, can you write songs about vocation or write songs about jobs? And it doesn't seem like a really romantic task. It doesn't seem like a really clear task, poetically speaking. So we took a couple different approaches to it. One approach was we put out a notice for a songwriting contest. We had about 300 entries. They were really interesting. It was kind of a great place to start to hear from these songwriters all over North America turning in these song ideas and these hymn ideas. From their perspective, that would be a worship song having to do with work. Sir, you remind us of our Savior's bull and towel. Teacher, you are raising up a child. People are wrestling with God in this issue. And some of the poetry, some of the hymns people turned in were very beautiful. May God's kingdom come on earth, his will be done. One example was a young man from San Francisco wrote an extended meditation on wood and nails in the scriptures, writing about Jesus being a carpenter and how his work, his vocation in the world, actually gives dignity to all work. And then from there, following through that imagery of wooden nails through the scriptures. Another song that was very beautiful that someone wrote was a song that was a blessing to people in each different sort of job. It sort of spoke a blessing to carpenters, it spoke a blessing to teachers. What else needs to be done then? So we're writing more and more songs about fewer and fewer things. This is one effort to write about our vocations. How could we build this missionary imagination where the neighbor is central? The love of God and the love of neighbor are the whole ball game. And also expand our horizons beyond just the topic of work and vocation. What else should we be thinking about? That's a big question. I'll talk for just a minute about this new project that we're launching called the Porter's Gate Worship Project. It seems clear to me, and you can certainly find evidence of this in many Christian journals and a lot of publications that have come out in the last five to 10 years, that the church in America has been experiencing something of an identity crisis. Certainly with people under the age of 40, a lot of pretty hard questions about what is the role of the church relative to our neighbors, relative to the cities and the towns in which we live. For some people, that's a conversation that's about lament. That's a conversation for some people about, oh, the church 
at one point had much more cultural authority and now it seems to be losing cultural authority. So that's sort of a narrative of decline. For others, that conversation is one that's more about contempt and resentment. People telling stories about, oh, I resent the relationship that I had, that the church had with the arts when I was growing up or something like that. But that identity crisis is real. And it's easy to attest to it, to just basically interview people coming out of churches on a Sunday morning and ask them a really basic question like, what is the church's relationship with the community or with the state? You're going to get pretty divergent answers. And I'm indebted in a lot of my thinking to this to Greg Thompson, who we both know and a lot of the writing and the work that he's done on, on this subject. And he himself is indebted to James Hunter in some of the same ways. But it seems to me that there have been two different narratives that the church has operated out of, particularly in the last 50 to 100 years. One narrative that basically defines the church in terms of its boundaries, in terms of its walls, that the church is the place where in order to be faithful, in order to pass the Christian faith down to our children, we need to have very clear lines of demarcation between us in the church and our neighbors outside of the church. We need to keep false ideologies from permeating into the church, and we need to build up our walls and build up the foundations of our faith even with something like Christian apologetics, that, you know, this is sort of the tradition I was raised in, that an understanding of Christian apologetics in this line is sort of like a weaponized version of Christian apologetics, that we teach our children the Bible explicitly so they can defend the faith to its assailants, right? That is sort of a boundary-driven, wall-driven vision of what the church's relationship with our neighbors is. And many of us from the broadly Reformed evangelical tradition can relate to something about that imagery. Then on the other hand, there is an image of the church that is all about different language that might be assigned to this, but ultimately about assimilation, about saying, well, where are our neighbors? Let's go to where our neighbors are. What are our neighbors like? Let's like what our neighbors like. What do our neighbors dislike? Let's dislike what they like. Let us fully inhabit all these places with our neighbors. And that the risk of that, and we've certainly seen this played out in many parts of the country over the last 50 or 100 years, is the church actually losing the identity, losing the very thing that it has to offer its neighbors for the sake of becoming too much like her neighbors. A different image that at our church over the last few years we've been talking about more and more is this image of the Benedictine monastery. Now, some people have baggage when it comes to thinking about monasteries as being you know, places that were all about people escaping, and there's some truth to that narrative, but for the sake of this conversation, thinking about the image of the Benedictine monastery as a place that, yes, did have boundaries, did have walls, that did have a sense of itself, a sense of what separated the practices and the life of the church from the practices and the life of the world. And yet, in the case of the Benedictine monastery, for all of the virtues being cultivated and for all of the ways of reimagining life together, that one of the virtues on which they placed the greatest emphasis was actually the virtue of hospitality. Yeah, there's still a way in. That there is still a way in. And there's a beautiful passage, if you read the rule of St. Benedict, in which Benedict, as this sort of elderly father speaking to these younger Christians, actually writes very eloquently about a particular church role, a role that we have sort of lost in our churches today. And it was the role of the porter. Some of us are only familiar with this word porter in terms of like the beer, like the porter's house. But that terminology actually comes from this role, that this role of the porter, that this person had the job of standing at the door of the monastery and actually looking out for visitors and for travelers and welcoming them in. And when welcoming them in, actually, as Benedict describes, representing the church to the world, actually being a person who is going to represent the church to their neighbors, not just in terms of their theological distinctives, but actually welcoming neighbors in to the church on the basis of the church's love and its hospitality, representing all of the best things about the body of Christ to these travelers and to these neighbors. And I loved that image so much that my wife and I, as we were discussing this worship project of sort of reimagining hymnody and reimagining collaboration, we sort of stole that image 
So this new project we're launching is called the Porter's Gate Worship Project. With that central image of the Porter's Gate, that is the door, the place of welcome, the place of hospitality, being the place where, for many people, is going to be their primary means of encounter with the church, that that means of encounter is going to be the Sunday worship gathering. Their means of encounter with the church is going to be through the songs that we sing and the prayers that we pray and the way that we preach. And recognizing that in order for us to have something to offer to our neighbors, we do have to have boundaries. In order for us to have something to offer to our neighbors, we do say, no, we do not believe this about personhood. We believe this. We don't believe this about vocation. We believe this. So there are the boundaries. But more than being marked by our boundaries, for us to actually be marked by our hospitality and by our welcome. And holding those two things in tension, which of course is going to be hard and which of course is going to present tensions, seems to me to be one of the most fundamental aspects of what it means to follow Jesus in this world. Thank you, Isaac. Vocation in the Common Good is a production of New City Commons and the Narrativo Group. This episode was produced by Mike Cosper and Philip Lorish. It was edited by TJ Hester, and it was mixed by Mark Owens. 